And I want you to biblically try to discern this, try to answer this. Okay, well, we are in Ephesians chapter 5 this evening, and we are right at verse 25, Ephesians 5, verse 25, 26 and 27, where Paul moves his attention off of the wives squarely on to the husbands. But this isn't just for husbands. This is for men that want to be husbands, and this is for wives that have husbands. So let's read the passage. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives. And then you'll notice, just as. Some translations say as. Some translations say even as. But the as is always there. Christ is the example. Christ is the one to be imitated here. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So if you think about what's happening here, Paul is producing the highest example of love that he can possibly produce. And he doesn't imply that it's impossible to imitate Christ. Verse 26 says that he gave himself for her, that's the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So you get the feel. Let's look, let's look at this again. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. So that's, that's the first thought. Husbands, your love like Christ did. Christ's love is expressed in this, the and, the conjunction there. He gave himself for her. And then we get a reason as to why he gave himself. The love gave, but the end goes even beyond that. There's a purpose clause here that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And then he carries on with that thought that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And obviously this is the example that the husband is supposed to be imitating. So let's think for just a second. In order to properly and rightly divide the word of truth, we need to get past any predispositions that we might have. You know, you know what can happen a lot of times? We have ideas already planted in our heads about what certain things mean to the point that it can be hard for us to actually grasp what it is that God is saying to us and what he's not necessarily saying to us. And you remember, Paul told Timothy about rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's think about that for a second. To rightly divide God's word, it means to cut a path, straight direction through the forest. It's like to cut a road across country through a forested area. 
otherwise difficult to pass through and to cut a road through it in a straight direction. That's what this word rightly dividing the word has the idea so that a traveler can go in a straight direction to his destination. These three verses are the forest and we wanna cut a straight path through them. And so our destination would be true. And I mean, this is a huge issue. If husbands are the head of the family and there's a way that husbands are supposed to treat the next most important person in the family, I mean, you talk about something that has to do with family integrity. There's no question about it. Strong families make for strong churches. Strong churches make for bright light in this world. So we want to have a proper grasp of what the Lord's saying to us here. So here's the first thing that I want to do. This, this often is helpful. First thing I want to do is go through a list of things that this does not say. So, so that's the first thing. We're going to think about what this doesn't say. Here's the first thing. I, I put together a list, I think, of 13 things that this doesn't say. And the reason I want to go through them is because sometimes we have our an idea already in our minds about what Paul's saying, or at least what we hope he's saying, what he might be saying, or our interpretation of what he's saying. So here's the first thing. This does not say, husbands, love your wives like other men in your church love your wives. Now, look, that's important. Because, you know, sometimes you can have a wife do you have the saying over here, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence? Yeah. Okay. Um, sometimes women can get the idea that other husbands are loving their wives better than their own husbands are loving them. And sometimes the expectation is, well, why can't my husband be like that person? And you know what? It's good to have good examples of love, men who are worth watching and imitating. But the reality is this, the fact that one brother, say, has a date night with his wife every Friday, that doesn't mean that that's the standard for everybody. You, you follow that. I mean, one wife might see what another husband does for his wife, and she might feel like, well, why you know, she might get after her husband. Why don't you do that for me? I just heard sister so-and-so got flowers. Why don't you ever get me flowers? And, <clears throat> but brethren, Adoniram Judson loved his wife so much that he took her to Burma, where she became riddled with tuberculosis and eventually got smallpox and died. And so, and here's a question that I would ask you. Do you think Christ was more likely to take his church out on a date night or lead them to lay down their lives for the sake of the gospel? Because remember who the example is here. See, we're not supposed to love. The standard for me is not how Sonny treats his wife or how Sharif treats his wife. My standard is Christ. And sometimes we forget exactly what his love tends to look like. And so that, that's the first thing. Second, this does not say, husbands, love your wives like husbands love their wives in the world. Now, maybe that doesn't need to be said among us. But you know what? In the world, where you basically have egalitarianism, where Everybody wants to be equal, that no head in the family. But what do husbands tend to encourage their wives towards? Being independent, being career oriented. Um, th they want to encourage equality across the board. Encourage them to encourage the wife to succeed in the world and look good in the world. Well, that obviously is, that's not loving like Christ loves. A third thing, 
this does not say husbands love your wives the way you saw your father love your mother. Now look, I'm not taking away from the fact that some of you may have had a good example. I think most of us, that's not the case. There may have been positive qualities about your fathers, but I have a feeling if the situation is much the same here as what I was used to in San Antonio, most, most of the people we had in our church were first generation Christians. You know what that means? They did not have saved fathers. Most, most of our fathers were not good examples. And I think this is important to emphasize, even though that might be very obvious to us. Well, no, it says love like Christ loved. It doesn't say love like our fathers loved. But one of the things that we have a, a, a real tendency to do is to be like our us men to be like our fathers and and basically to imitate the weaknesses. I mean, one of the things that we have to do is abandon the ways of our forefathers. Isn't that what Peter said? Our forefathers had certain ways about them and becoming a Christian, that's one of the big things we want to abandon. I think, I, you know, Tim was telling me earlier about many of the good qualities that his own father had. And undoubtedly, there are things we, we can imitate but in so many ways, our fathers fell short. So another thing that this does not say, does not say husbands love your wives whatever way you desire to love them. Since after all, you're the head, you're the head of the family, you're the head of your wife, and she's supposed to obey you. Husbands, you're not free to do whatever you want, however you want, whenever you want. Obviously, the example is Christ, and he's saying, men, put your eyes on me and watch how I love. Here's another thing. It does not say husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church when you feel like it. Since, after all, it's, it's okay to have bad days and forget about it at times. It's understandable when you don't feel well or when you've got a migraine headache or when you feel depressed or your favorite team lost or you just hit your hammer or hit your finger with a hammer, then it's, then it's okay to, to be unchristlike. It doesn't, it, this isn't a hit and miss thing. This isn't a take it or leave it thing. This, this, we're being called to a standard that's constant here. Something else this doesn't say. It doesn't say, husbands, you can never really love your wife like Christ loved the church because no one can do that. No one has ever done that. I mean, this, that standard's just way too high, so it really can't be taken seriously. Now, brothers, this is, this is really important because I'm afraid that by default, there are parts of scripture we just, we don't hear because they seem over the top to us. They seem too dogmatic. They seem, they, they seem too out there. The standard seems too high. It seems unreachable, unattainable. It just seems like it's beyond our grasp. And so we come to that conclusion and then we just bail out and we abandon the whole deal. Brothers, Paul is dead serious here. He wants us to be striving to love our wives like Christ loved the church. And he, and he in no way says, well, Christ laying down his life, giving himself up for the church, is just, that's so special, that's so unique, that men, you, you can't even come close to imitating that. He doesn't talk that way. Now, I know Christ's death is unique. I know him giving himself is indeed special. But the reality is there's still a standard here that we are to be pressing towards. Something else this doesn't say. It does not say, husbands, pray for the grace to love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's key. You hear what I just said? It doesn't say, pray that Christ will help you love your wife. Hey. Yes, prayer is good, but you know, oftentimes prayer can be a cop-out. I know as a pastor, I have too often heard men say, well, I'm praying about that. 
Why are you praying about that? You don't need to pray about that. The Bible is very explicit. The Bible is very plain. You need to obey what God says in his word. You need to do what God says. And so, um, I look, I recognize we need God's help to do this. I recognize we need the grace of God. And I'm certainly not saying we shouldn't pray. But you hear what I am saying. Oftentimes, we're praying when we ought to be acting. We're praying when we really ought to do what we already know God has told us to do. Prayer can simply be an excuse. We're unwilling to do what God says, and so, well, we're praying about it. Another thing that this does not say, it doesn't say, husbands, love your wives the way you imagine Christ loved the church. Now, that's key. Because we can have these ideas, but, you know, we need to study. We need to strive to know Christ. We need to strive to see Christ. We need to strive to study how indeed he loved. You know what? We need to watch him interact with his church. Because the fact is he laid down his life, yes, a tremendous act of sacrifice and self-emptying. He emptied himself. But do you know, he walked with people from the church when he walked this earth. And if we watch how he interacted with Peter and the rest, if we watch how he, how he interacted with his people, you see, we really want to study that. We want to look closely at that because sometimes we can get an idea about how Christ loved and it doesn't really match reality. It's not just the way we imagine that he loved. Paul is actually pressing us to imitate Christ in the way that his love really was. I mean, almost everyone in this world that has ever heard of Christ has constructed some sort of false image of who Christ is. See, this is a big deal. What we want and need to be fighting for all the time is that we have an accurate biblical perspective of who Christ is. You know how it is. All of you, before you got saved, you had an idea about Christ. They were A lot of those ideas were wrong ideas. I can tell you about mine. I saw Mary as superior to Christ. I saw Christ as less than God. I saw Christ more like a baby in a manger. I, 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 my, my views of Christ were off and they were small. And the truth is that we all have to undo false ideas, even as Christians. We, this is one of the reasons that we need to constantly be in Scripture, that we might learn of Christ and develop a more thorough knowledge of who he is and how he is, and how he loved. If that's the example we're supposed to be imitating, we need to see that example the way it really is. It's very, very easy to construct a Christ who loves us the exact way we love our own selves. You, you follow what I just said there? Typically, that's what we do. We construct a God, or we construct a Christ, who loves us like we love ourselves. In other words, we imagine him, we kind of project our own love for ourselves on him. And that we don't want to do that. Because see, we have an idea about out of our love for ourselves what we would do for ourselves. But have you ever noticed that Christ often brings things into the life of his church that we would not wish upon ourselves? And so we have to be very careful. We have to see how Christ truly loved, not just the way that we imagine that he loved. Here's another thing this doesn't say. It does not say, husbands, love your wives so much that you live primarily for them. See, loving Christ, loving, loving the, your wife like Christ loved the church doesn't mean that 
you're living primarily for your wife. And you know these verses. 1 Corinthians 7.29 But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Isn't that an interesting statement? Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. It, it's the idea that we're moving quickly through this life. It's the idea that uh, the, the relationship with our wife is much like our our possessions, and many things in this life, our sorrowing, our weeping, we're moving through this life fast. The things here are transient. The things here are changing. And then we, we could even go over to this reality that Christ said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, and wife, and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And so one of the things that we need to remember in loving our wives is that that, that love has to be secondary to seek, seeking first the kingdom and seeking also the, the glory of God and, and seeking the will of Christ. This also, this, this passage about loving your wives as Christ loved the church, it does not say, husbands, love your wives so much that you'll never give your wife any rules to follow or any commandments to obey. I mean, one of the things we need to remember here is verse 25 does not negate the previous verses. You remember verses 22 through uh, 24. 25 does not negate the fact that wives should submit to their own husbands, that the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands and everything. You see, we can almost confuse the two. It's like, it's like if you get a wrong perspective about what it means to love your wife, you can almost get to where you could feel, well, it's not very loving to my wife to expect her to obey me. And to be a head over here. Love doesn't mean that a husband can't be a strong leader it, with strong opinions and strong convictions about how to lead his household and, and what goals ought to be pursued and what standards are upheld. You remember how Joshua was? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Having strong leadership is not in conflict with this. And so, men, you have to recognize Sometimes women can, the, there can be self-pity, they can sulk, they can make a husband feel like it's not loving to her to expect her to fall in line with the headship of the husband, but that's, that's simply not the case. So here's another one. This does not say husbands love your wives so that they feel loved. Now, hear, hear me carefully. Don't, don't run to a wrong opinion on this. It does not say husbands love your wives so that they feel loved. Now, look, I'm not saying it isn't good for your wife to feel loved. I'm just saying that can't be the standard. You follow what I'm saying? If, if a man is concerned all the time about whether his wife feels loved, he's not putting the proper standard before his eyeballs. The standard is how Christ loved the church, not whether his wife feels loved. And, and that's too low a standard. That's my point here. It's just too low. I want my wife to feel loved, but that is not the primary standard. The primary standard is how Christ loved the church. This does not say, husbands, love your wives according to their felt needs. This does not say, husbands, love your wives the way your wives want to be loved. 
Now, look, the truth is, let's just think about this. I'm, I'm wanting us to be biblical. The truth is, Christ does not love us the way we always wish to be loved. If <laughs> not only does Jesus often not give us what we want, he does actually, <laughs> I, I would say at times, but I think it's even more than that. Jesus often does not give us what we would choose. And, and what I want you to recognize is that really is what supreme love does. How many of you can say, listen, Jesus has not answered some of the prayers that if, if, if I wanted Jesus to be like I want him to be and love me the way that I would love me, or, or for a wife to say it like that, you know, the, the, <clears throat> I want to be loved the way that I want to be loved. I want to be loved the way that I feel loved. I want to be loved in the way that I feel like my felt needs are being met. But Jesus comes along and he doesn't love us that way. He loves us with a supreme love. He loves us with a goal in mind that often, quite honestly, takes us down a path we would never choose for ourselves. You see where I'm going with that? For a husband to choose a path for his wife that she might not choose for herself, but the husband has bigger goals in mind, you see, that might actually be loving just like Christ loved the church. A woman might say, wife might say, well, if my husband loved me the way that he's supposed to, he would dot, dot, dot. You can fill in the blank. Well, the reality is, though, if your husband loves you the way that he's supposed to love you, then he's going to love you the way that Christ loves his church. That's the right answer. But that demands some thinking on our part. We need to ask the next question, how does Christ love his church? See, this is key, brothers. This is key, absolutely essential to how you're going to lead and be a loving leader. And so let's think about it. Notice the verses again, verses 25, 26, 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. We see that his love included great sacrifice. But you know, even when a husband is making great sacrifices for his wife, he still may be leading her down a path that is not always the most comfortable. It may not always be the path that she most desires to go herself. But notice the end in view. Christ gave himself, not just so that her sins would be forgiven. Christ gave himself for her, and her here is obviously the church. It's the people of God. That's, to you, that's all of us. This, that applies to every one of us here that are saved. Why did Christ give himself? Out of love. But what was his end in view? What's he seeking? Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Husbands are to love their wives just like that, just as Christ also loved the church. So the question again, how does Christ love his church? Notice that he loves her with an end in view. Christ's love is not random. Man, that's, that's critical. You see, what, we need to be going somewhere with our love. There needs to be an objective. Christ's love is manifest so as to bring his bride to a very expected end. Do you all see that? Christ's love is not arbitrary here. So husbands, if you're to love just as Christ also loved, 
then your love can be no more arbitrary than his is. Christ is loving us toward something. His love beautifies us. He loves his church so as to produce sanctification and cleansing and glory and no spot and no wrinkle or any such thing, holy, without blemish. If we're going to love our lives or love our wives toward some sort of goal in mind, then we've got to think, husbands, what should your love, a, a sacrificial love on your part, a giving of yourself for your wife? This isn't just about putting flowers on the table, remembering your anniversary. You see, it's much deeper. It goes far deeper. It's, we need to be loving with an end in view. Where are we headed? Where are we going? What's the goal? That's, that's, we've, got to, we've got to work this out in our minds. He gave himself, but not haphazardly or randomly. He sacrificed for us. His love, his love is expressed in the greatest imaginable sacrifice, death on a cross. But you notice, though he was willing to drink wrath for us, he doesn't free us from suffering. He doesn't free us from difficulty. He doesn't coddle us or meet all our felt needs. This is critical. This is, this is really, really important. Think of Christ's love for his people. Listen, let me give you an example. The Lord said to Ananias, you remember Ananias? He was the one that went and laid his hands on the apostle Paul when he was still Saul. And the scales fell from his eyes. In Acts 9, it says, The Lord said to Ananias, this is after Paul's Damascus Road experience, Go, for he, Paul, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, I just want you to grasp that. Did Jesus love Paul? Yes. Did Jesus give Paul flowery beds of ease? Just the opposite. He said, I'm going to show him what things he's going to suffer for my namesake. Listen to what Paul says. 2 Corinthians 6. In all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. He talks about tribulation. He's been in necessity, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. When you jump over to 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, stripes. He's being whipped. He's being beaten. He's in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. Now, you need to recognize that. What does deaths often mean? How do you die more than once? Do you know Christ tells us to die to self and to carry our cross daily? This is what he's talking about. Daily dying to luxuries and privileges and pleasures, daily dying. He's, he told the Corinthians he chose not to have a wife like Peter had. He, he chose not to take financial assistance in certain situations. This, this death, deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. 
Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, weariness and toil, sleeplessness often, hunger and thirst, fastings often, cold and nakedness. Now listen, is Paul a vessel of Christ's love? Certainly he is. Do you recognize where I'm going with all of this? See, we can have these predispositions to what love ought to look like. What I'm saying is this. Christ's love is not going to keep us in this place forever. But you know full well that he is putting us through difficulty now because it's working an eternal weight of salvation an eternal weight of glory. So the Lord, think about this. You Christians know this. I would just ask you this. How has Christ loved you? Has he given you flowers? Undoubtedly. Has he given you blessings? Certainly. But has he also given you trials? Has he given you suffering? Now look, that, that doesn't mean... I'm not, I'm not saying to husbands that you need to cause your wife pain, but, but I want you to see where I'm going with all of this. Does the Lord at times hide his face from his people? He does. At times he does not give us what we pray for. That's, that's true. He does not protect us from pain, from suffering, from sorrow. Why? I mean, see, here's the real thing. Why? Because he has our greatest good in mind. Do you know what the scripture says? He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He'll purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Do you recognize what Peter tells us? We are that holy priesthood. We are that royal priesthood. That's precisely what the New Testament tells us. And you know what Jesus says? I'm going to put them through the fire so that they come forth pure. Or we have, we have that very famous text in Hebrews 12. We know full well that we don't want to despise chastening. Why? We don't want to be discouraged when we're rebuked by the Lord. Why? For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Now, look, am I saying that husbands need to be like a father to his child and spank them? That's not what I'm saying. But what, what I'm saying is that our love needs to be aiming for the big picture Taking our wives down paths that may not always be what they want. It may not always be the most comfortable for them. That's what I'm getting after. Because if we really have a big picture about how to love our wives, we need to be thinking of way beyond, is my wife the most happy that she could be right now based on all I'm doing for her and all that I am giving to her? What we need to do is have the objectives in mind that we're actually heading towards a, a, the best end possible. Because that's, that's how Christ loves. See, Christ has in mind that we're going to be glorious in the end. He has in mind we're not going to have a spot, a blemish, a wrinkle, no such thing. Nothing like that. See, he's loving us to perfection. He's loving us beautiful. That's what we want. We want, to be, we want to be moving in a certain direction. Now, look, I'm well aware a husband can create hardship and pain and deny his wife's request out of just pure selfishness, out of a lack of love. But what I'm seeking to point out is that true love and love like Christ, it looks at the big picture. It looks at what's best. That's the point. It thinks about the ultimate end in all of this. Where are we going? 
what what are my wife and I aiming at? I mean, are, are you all just existing? Do you, do you just exist in your marriage? Is it just about, well, you, you, how much fun we can have at our next anniversary? Is it just, where are we going? I mean, what are my wife and I really aiming at? Love is not all about taking the easy path or the softest path. Listen, listen to how scripture talks about the love of Christ. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Wow. I mean, here it is. Paul talking about the love of Christ again. But then he says this, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. No, it's written, for your sake we're killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, or any such created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what I'm pointing out is this. If we're going to really be honest about the love of Christ, that love does not spare us from difficulties, provided those difficulties are leading to our greatest possible end. That's key. Because we, husbands, you don't want to be afraid to necessarily take your wife down some paths where she gets calluses on her hands. And life might be a bit difficult, but you're aiming at something that is glorious in the end. Now, listen, I want you to hear two verses that have always jumped out at me, that Paul speaks specifically to the Corinthian church, but he's talking about his authority. Paul, as an apostle, had authority over the church. Husbands, you have authority over your wife. So there's a parallel here. And I want you to hear what Paul says. Would we not readily agree that our goal, men, our goal as head of our wives, we're going to do what we can to use our authority to achieve the highest possible end. That's the issue. We have authority. We're head. We want to achieve the highest possible end. And and here's what Paul says to the Corinthians. Even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification, not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. And then in 2 Corinthians 13, he says something very similar. Therefore, I write these things, being absent, Thus being present, I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. When we have the good of those in mind who are under our authority, we might speak strongly, we might speak even sharply, but it's not to destroy. It's not to beat down. Authority, Paul says, is given for edification. You see, men, that's what we want to use our authority for. We want to figure out how to build up our wives in the best possible way to achieve the best possible end. And I can tell you this, everything we find in the New Testament does not tell us that the best possible end is achieved by living the softest life possible. It's not by trying to alleviate your wife from as many responsibilities in this world or tackle half the diapers so so that you free her up. It, it's not that kind of thing. I mean, I'm, look, love might have to do with what, how much you help your wife in a given situation with how many of her children that there, there are. But what we need to remember is our authority. We need to really be using it to build up and to be aiming someplace. Now, look, Ruby and I, yesterday, we listened to John Piper's biographical sketch of Adoniram Justin. And here is a man who had the big picture in mind. He had a big view with regards to having a wife. 
Now, this, what I want you to hear, some of you may be familiar with this. If you're familiar with it, please bear with me and hear it again. This is the letter that Adoniram Judson wrote to his future father-in-law when he was asking for his daughter's hand in marriage. This, this is Mr. Hazeltine. This was Anne Hazeltine's father. And Judson wants to marry her. Listen to the letter that he wrote to Mr. Hazeltine. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring, to see her no more in this world, whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life, whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you? For the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God? Can you consent to all this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory? with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamations of praise, which shall resound to her Savior from heathen, saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. You see, brethren, Adoniram Judson's letter to his future father-in-law was fulfilled and did go with Adoniram. And they did go to India. And from India, they sailed to Burma. Do you know that just in the time from India to Burma, Anne gave birth to a dead baby. And they just dropped its body in the water. You see, this was fulfilled. Her second child, Roger, was born in 1815 and died at eight months. Her third child, Maria, lived only six months. And then Anne herself died in 1826 of smallpox. Anne suffered tuberculosis, numerous, numerous hardships, and she died. And there was a grave there by the ocean, her and her third child under a big banyan tree. She died for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and came to rescue us. Do you see what I'm talking about here? Is that unloving for a man to take his wife into a life like that? Now, see, I'm not saying that we're all going to go to Burma. We're not all going to go to the tropics. We're not all going to do it in the early 1800s when there were very few medicines available and there was you were basically exposed to the elements but brothers and sisters, what are we living for? You see, this is, this is the issue. Husbands, you need to determine where you're taking the family. And, and you need to figure out how you're going to best live for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Adoniram and Ann Judson, they left their homes, they left their families to spread the glory of God to an unreached people group. What are we going to do? You see, this is the big question. Brethren, you know what I want? I want for Ruby and I to have lived for most for the glory of God as it's possible for us to live. I want us, I don't want us to, quite honestly, I don't want Ruby to have the easiest life here. I want Ruby to have the greatest rewards there. I want us to, to get there. And you recognize, husbands, if you're on that agenda, oftentimes you're not going to get your wife flowers. I doubt he was buying his wife flowers on, on Valentine's Day. Why? Because any money that they had, it needed to go to, to printing tracts and to getting the gospel to the heathen. You see, brethren, this, this isn't just about making our wife's felt needs all met. It isn't about giving our wives the greatest amount of comfort possible. Now, look, it's not being cruel and it's not being insensitive. It's really having the big picture here. Look, you may get flowers. You may take your wife out to dinner. I'm not, I'm not knocking those things. But see, the real issue is where are we going? What are we seeking to accomplish? 
the, Judson, Judson, after, after 12 years, he had only 18 converts. But I'll tell you this, by the time he died at the age of 61, they had, they had 100 churches, over 8,000 believers. And today, Myanmar has the third greatest population of Baptists on the face of the earth. Only the United States and India coming before them. That's, that's the fruit that was left. Judson, while he was there, he wrote a grammar of the language. He put, he put the Bible into the Burmese language. It took him 24 years to complete. And God used his life and God used Anne's life towards plans of ultimate good. And Judson was not mostly concerned that his wife be comfortable in this life. And you know what? He loved his wives. Ruby and I were listening to the testimony of his third wife. She said her first year of marriage to, to Adoniram was the greatest year of her life. She's out there in the heathen tropics, boiling in 42 degree heat every single day. High humidity, no escape from it. And she said it was, I mean, that's he was a great husband. But when Judson wrote, to the father of his first wife, Anne. He might have written the kind of letter that we would expect men to write to husband or to fathers today. I mean, think about it. How would the average, even in our, even in our comfortable Western churches, how would the average guy go about writing a letter to ask for a man's daughter in marriage? Well, I'm going to provide well for her, and I'm basically going to meet her needs. And I'm, I'm, isn't that how? Who's going to write a letter to say, you know, you're probably never going to see your daughter again. She's probably going to die, even possibly a very horrible death. She's going to be exposed to all manner of suffering. But see, see, this this goes beyond what the the picture that we've got to get in our minds is that our wife, as much as we're supposed to love our wives, like Christ loved the church, we're looking at the end. We're looking at where we're going in all this. We're looking at what we're striving towards. When we basically boil love down to whether the husband is going to, you know, change 50% of the diapers or not, it seems like what happens is we've lost the big picture. I mean, yes, Love may have something to say about changing diapers when your wife is sick or when your wife is whatever. I mean, it may be that your wife is gift of teaching and you want her to go spend the evening with the sisters and she's going to bring teaching on, on you know, she's in, she's gets to the point where she's an older woman in the church and she's supposed to be teaching the younger women. And it may be probably by then you don't have any little children that need to have their diapers changed. But I mean, making decisions where you're really trying to figure out how are we going to be most fruitful? How are my wife and I as a team going to live to, to strive to be a hundredfold fruitful rather than 30-fold? I mean, we, brethren, we don't want this narrow little view popping around in our brains about how Christ loved the church. You recognize Christ loved the church, and he is aiming at glory and beauty. He's aiming at the highest possible. You, you remember what scripture says. It says that we're all servants, and we've all been given certain talents. You remember there were servants, and one servant had five talents, and one servant had two talents, and the other one had one talent. Brethren, I'll tell you this. We want to use the talents God has given to us. And if that means that my wife is going to help me use mine, or we're going to combine as a team, we're going to, the husband needs to be thinking. He's the head. He's been given authority. He wants to use that authority for edification. He wants to use it to build up. He wants to use it to achieve the greatest possible ends. We, we need to think outside our little Western boxes about what it means to love Christ, like love the church and what? Get her a nice house to live in? I'm not knocking that providing for your family isn't something that Christians need to be doing. But listen, we can't be so narrow about what Christ's love for the church means. The truth is Christ really didn't promise us an easy path here. And, and marrying a Christian wife, and if we're really going to carry out the mission that Christ has given to each one of us, it doesn't necessarily mean that my love is going to produce the easiest life for my wife. How can I love my wife and give myself so that my wife 
will have the greatest possible reward when she stands before the living Christ. Men, love your wives that way. Love your wives enough to give yourself in prayer for them. Love your wives enough to give them the time to be in the scriptures, to time to walk with the Lord and talk with the Lord and be with the Lord and grow in the Lord. Love, love does these kinds of things. You're, you're, you want to love your wives enough to not give them everything they want, but what is going to lead to you and her striving together to be as profitable as possible. Love her enough to seek first the kingdom of God not to seek first her own comfort and felt needs and the clothing she wants and the new shoes she wants. Look, there may be a place to buy her new shoes or even two pairs of new shoes. You recognize I'm not, I'm not drawing any specific, Christ often gives us great gifts, but he also often withholds things that we want. He often gives us a bed of silk, but it may be followed up by a bed on briars. I mean, that's the reality of walking through this life. And what we all tend to know is the times of being in the fire and the times of suffering typically are most edifying and most productive. And I'm not saying we have to necessarily make life hard on our wives, typically to try to be that purifying, sanctifying element. But you recognize what I am saying. I'm, I'm saying we can become so small-minded and so worldly-minded to where we measure love by flowers or remembering an anniversary or something like that. When the real picture, I think Adoniram Judson hit it right on the head. I mean, what, what, ladies, truthfully, how will you have wished to have lived your lives when you come to stand before Christ? Would you rather have a soft, everything you wanted in this life kind of life? Or would you rather have walked in the, in the footsteps of Ann Judson? I can tell you, I, gra glad, I mean, I, when I hear about their lives, I feel like I'm doing nothing. I want to do, I want to do more. I want us to excel more. I want us to, uh, Christ's aim was to beautify us. What we want to aim at is that our wives might be as sanctified, as cleansed, as, as glorious, as spot-free, as wrinkle-free, as, as gloriously robed and fruitful as possible. Christ is loving us beautiful, and that's what we need to be striving towards. He does what he does. And he gives himself in the way he gives himself in order to present us to himself as a glorious church. And the truth is, the path to becoming altogether glorious is not the easy path. Our wives are the weaker vessel. So we do need to be mindful of that when we set the direction and we set the goals. We set the pace, but we have to ask, what are we really living for? What is it that, what's, what is, is my main task to help my wife have her own independent identity and successful career? Is, is that really it? Is my main task to split all the, all the house cleaning duties equally? with her? Is that what love does? Or does love fight for my wife's greatest reception before the judgment seat of Christ? Our authority is not given to us to be tyrants or to sit in our easy chair and bark orders at our wives. It's not that. Our, our, it's, it's not to be insensitive. If a husband's going to say that he's head of his wife, he also needs to be ready to say that he loves his wife and, he, and he's striving to love her like Christ loved the church. But we need to remember very, very, very carefully how it is that Christ does love the church. Brothers, we've got to apply these truths to our minds. We've got to grapple with this. Christ loved. Christ loved the church 
in spite of our unworthiness. I mean, he loved us in spite of our deficiencies. That's how Christ's love was. We needed to be washed. We needed to be cleansed. He saw us in our rags. He saw us in our blood. He saw us in our sins. But he loved us. He loved the church. And he gave himself. I mean, that's, that's the height of the doctrine of salvation. We were ugly. And yet he took us to be his bride. He loved us not because of anything in us. He loved us in spite of what was true about us. We weren't just neutral. We were ugly. It's not that we just weren't beautiful. We were kind of plain Jane. We were, we were disgustingly ugly. And he loved us. He loved the ungodly. And all our unworthiness and all of our vileness and all of our pride and all of our selfishness, he laid down his life for his bride. And sacrifice undoubtedly is a characteristic of Christ's love for his church. This love is the love that gives. He gave himself. It's not always considering what it can get out of the deal. We have to think about our wife's greatest good and how to use our authority to help her to that end. If you want to test whether a man's love for his wife is what it ought to be, I mean, you don't want to listen to what he says. You, you want to look at what he does, what he is. That's the test. Christ humbled himself, and he emptied himself, and he gave himself at great, great cost to himself. He did it for the good of the church. I mean, there she was. You know the condition she was in, under condemnation following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. And what he did, he did to rescue her out of that. She was in her, in her rags. He came and took her sins upon himself. He bore them in, a, in his own body on a tree so that we might be reconciled to God, thereby killing the wrath. He delivered us from that condemnation. But, but he didn't leave it at that. He wants us to be his bride. He, he's saved us not just to atone for our sins. He did that. Not just to reconcile us to God, but he did that. It doesn't end there. It's all so that he might present. Isn't that interesting? We think about presenting somebody to somebody else. Here, here they are, and we present them. He's actually doing this to us in order to present us to himself. It's like, you know, the bride, a father, a father brings the bride down the aisle and puts the bride's hand in the husband's hand. The father presents his daughter. Christ is presenting the bride to himself. Christ walks her down the aisle and Christ is the husband. And he presents her. And do you know, she is stunningly beautiful. That's, that's precisely what Paul says. That's what the love was meant to lead to. To present her to him as a glorious bride without defect. He has a complete purpose in it all. And so, men, in all our sacrifices for our wives, it should be just the same. We're to love as Christ loved. What is the complete purpose? Do you know when you go to the book of Revelation, it says this. Listen to this verse. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. That's where the bride is being presented Christ is presenting the bride to himself. The marriage of the lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. 
and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, did you catch that? The bride is robed in a garment that is stitched out of the very threads and fabric of the righteous acts of the saints. Do you recognize what that's saying? Our beauty, he beautifies us. But one of the things that the wife herself does is it says, the wife has made herself ready. What aspect, in what way, in what shape, in what form does she make herself ready to be presented? Well, by the clothing she wears. And the clothing she wears is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, brothers, I can tell you this. If we're li living for the big picture, we want our wives to wear a robe that is as full of the acts of goodness and righteousness as possible. We, you, you recognize what this is. There's, an, there's another place here in Revelation 14 that it says that our works follow us. You see, the, what we do in this life we're going to be robed with in eternity. It's no small thing. Brothers, we need to think about the big picture. You and I have a wife, or we will have a wife, in order to give ourselves in love to her, to help prepare her to be... Do you, do you, do you recognize this? Husbands, we are helping prepare our wife to be married to another. And I hope that doesn't stir any jealousy in you because you're going to be you're going to be that bride too right alongside your wife but you're actually preparing your wife to be married to Christ you are actually helping in making her beautiful to be presented to him in that day because you are going to be by your leadership and by your headship you're going to be directly instrumental in how much she's built up. Remember, Paul said, this authority was given me not to tear down, not to destroy, but to build up, to edify. That's what authority is given to us for. Your authority has been given for you to strive to be ahead of your wife, to lead her to the greatest usefulness and the greatest beauty and the greatest works and fruitfulness so that there is absolutely maximized beauty to receive the greatest possible reward, to run this race as fast as possible, to walk with basically to walk with this woman that God gives you to strive after the greatest possible ends. That's what Christ did. He loved and his love was sacrificial and his love was going somewhere. There's an end in view. And so men, if I can just instill anything in you from the study tonight, don't, don't seek to love haphazardly or randomly, know where you're going. I mean, look, not everybody gets five talents. Some people get two talents, some people get one talent. But you need to figure out what it is that Christ has given to you and to your wife. And then you need to be strategically thinking about how to maximize it, how to use it for the greatest glory of Christ, for the greatest extension of his kingdom, for the greatest for the greatest usefulness and fruitfulness in this life. Don't, men, you, you don't want to just simply be thinking about your wife's felt needs or what makes her feel loved. You really need to be thinking beyond that. Those are too low a standard. 
thinking, I mean, knowing how your light, wife feels loved is, is undoubtedly a good thing. I mean, it, a lot of times wives feel unloved because they actually are unloved because their husband's love does fail. But if, if we're really striving to love like Christ loved, then you know what? There's, there's days to eat and there's days to enjoy flowers and there's days to enjoy anniversaries. And there's, there's days to give your wife a break and give your wife a rest. But there's also days to work. There's days for your wife to give calluses on her hand. And there's days for possible sleeplessness and suffering in pursuing the will of God and pursuing the greatest possible good that you can do while you have life. Because brethren, if the works we do end up being the garment we wear, if, if Revelation 14 is true that our works follow us, we only get one shot at this. Husbands, making the way as easy as possible for your wife is never the way of greatest fruitfulness. That, that would not be the way of greatest love. Greatest way you can love your wives is that they get the most thunderous, well done, good and faithful servant at the end. That's what you really want to help them towards and love them towards. You want to strive to love them beautiful like Christ does. That's the real goal here. Well, any feedback, comments? Anybody want to shout, scream, or attack the preacher? Are we going to get silence? Um, I'll just say, like, listening to that's kind of, like revolutionize the way I think about like kind of Ephesians and like them three verses um you know, it's like a, the lights kind of went on a bit more so um it was very helpful and very hard for me amen any other interaction feedback Any questions? Anything anybody want to ask? Tim? So, so if, uh, if, um, if there was a... If you've got a man who, who desires to be a missionary and uh, sh should he lay that on the table when entering a relationship so that she's aware that that's actually his desire. And if she's not really willing to do that, then does that kind of, I guess, perhaps that affects things to some degree, right? I mean, she could I know submit that. She could, the heart could be changed, but I'm just wondering, like, you know, is that something that should be laid on the table? There was, there was a certain prominent man in my life when I got married, who had concerns about me marrying Ruby because I had real aspirations for the mission field and Ruby never expressed those things. But my pastor answered that, that brother by saying that Ruby had given every indication that she was willing to follow me. And see, that was the bigger issue. Do you have a wife that's willing to follow where God leads you? And, and I'm not going to say that it, I mean, I think that that would be a good thing to talk about. Do you all know the, the um, Henry Martin story? Do you know who Henry Martin was? Anybody? He was a Church of England missionary that Charles Simeon was responsible 
for Charles Simeon was an evangelical Anglican, and he was responsible for the sending forth of Henry Martin. Henry Martin went forth in the days of William Carey, Marshman and Ward, as they worked in Sarampur there in India. Henry Martin sailed there, was in India for a season, and then went into Persia and put the scriptures in the Persian language. He had a girlfriend at home here in the UK who, her name was Lydia, and she just, she would not follow him onto the mission field. And so I, I think that that would be a good thing. And, and, you know, sometimes men get called to the mission field after they're married. But is there a place to seek to help bring the wife along? Yes. I think one of the things you can really help, I've always found that one of the things that I wanted to do was I just wanted to make sure that Ruby always had the ability and the tools to be able to walk as close to Christ as possible. And, uh, you know, if, if you really help promote your wife's godliness, help encourage it. If she's walking close to the Lord and the Lord's will is that you go to the mission field, she probably will, if not have a sense of it, not, not be ready to, to kick against it. Tim? Pop? Wasn't it William Carey's first wife that said, you were called, but I wasn't. And she rebelled and she uh, had a very difficult time in the mission field, right? Actually, Carey's first wife is kind of an ugly story. Yes. He was ready to go to the mission field without her. And then at the last second, because they were delayed, the other man that Carrie was going to the mission field with went and sought to persuade Carrie's wife to come. She very quickly packed and went, but she resented it the entire time, eventually yes. went insane and died. Right, yeah. But now his second wife seemed to be a great wife. Right. All three of Adoniram Judson seemed to be really good wives. But yes, Carrie, <laughs> there were definite issues with his first wife. Yes. Well, listen, uh, that lesson was excellent for, for, for almost any wedding, I would say. Uh, exceptional advice for, for marriage. Uh, what I'd like to say for, the, for those young people that are married, Appreciate your wife while you have her, because I, uh, I lost mine, and um, it was sad and heartbreaking. So um, enjoy your wife while you have her, and send her flowers from time to time. I would say, <laughs> of course, uh, you know, I, I, I know exactly what you were getting to. Um, uh, it's just one expression of love. I know that all women, I presume, love flowers. So I, I've always been one that um, thought that um, this is a good way of expressing uh, your love on special occasions, like you were saying, anniversaries and birthdays, a uh, bouquet of flowers, maybe a um, candy or something like this, you know. But um, there's other more important ways that you can show love for your wife, that's, that's for sure. Well, Papa had... Didn't always have the smoothest marriage. He had some rocky seasons, but yeah. at the end, his wife, Ruby's mom, got dementia, and the whole church just watched Papa love her and care for her, and uh, I think that was a powerful example. Yes, it was very heartbreaking, a very difficult time, difficult trial in my life, yes, for sure, yeah. But the Lord gave me strength and grace and patience through it all. And uh, it gave me a stronger faith as a result of that trial. So it was a difficult experience. But like I say, the Lord sustained me and gave me uh, extraordinary patience and love for her like I'd never known before. Yeah. Thank God for his grace, yes. I'm 
thank you for sharing. What else? Anything else? Lydia, did Thomas ever tune in? You're hiding over there, brother. There he is. <laughs> yeah. I like this corner because he extends. <laughs> well, what else? I just want to say that um, our church is praying for you folks. And I know there's, um, you are evangelizing and there's a, it's a big challenge. And, uh, but our prayers are with you, all of you brethren. Yes. May the Lord continue to use you, give you courage and patience and much grace as you evangelize and try to build the church for the kingdom of God. Well, we appreciate it. We greatly covet the prayers. Brother, can I ask a quick question, please? I mean, I, it doesn't have to be uh, exhaustive, uh, but um, <clears throat> where do you draw the line um, when you want the spiritual best for your wife, for example, uh, which would de demand a lot of, not sure what's going on, which would demand a lot of uh, self-denial? And, uh, you know, at the same time, you don't want to be basically tyrannical <clears throat> over your wife and just deny things for, for the sake of it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's difficult to, to answer a broad question like that with specific answers. Um, be, because there's not a, there's not a, I mean, look, even the way Paul puts it, husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. Wow, that is such a broad statement. We all have to work that out. But I, th I think if our mindset is, I mean, look, one of the things a husband, it's, it's been said, we read this from Rebecca last Wednesday. I mean, she was stating, and I think who is she quoting, Amy Carmichael or, or Elizabeth Elliot? But prayer is one of the greatest sacrifices we can make for somebody else. I mean, no matter what situation your wife is in, you can definitely pray for your wife. And I mean, we really do need to trust in the, the Lord who answers our prayers and changes things and is able to make things happen that we can't make happen. But um I, I, I can't say exactly where that line is. I, I mean, it, but if Christ is the example, I would ask this question. Was Christ at times very gentle with his disciples? Yes. At times when they should have been rebuked and you could almost expect one coming, he didn't. Instead, he went into a very um, compassionate teaching manner. Other times, we're almost blown away by the harshness of his responses. They almost catch us off guard. And so when we watch, look, Christ loved Peter. That didn't keep him from calling Peter Satan. Whatever you want to do with that, whatever you think he meant by that. The, the fact is that, is there a time for being strong? Is there a time to use authority like Paul? I mean, Paul could say to the Corinthians, look, I don't want to use my authority in a way that's, that's going to be strong. I don't want to be sharp. I will be if I have to, but I don't want to be. And I think that that's the position of that we need to have as somebody in authority that we have to measure the different circumstances that we're confronted with. Sometimes one approach and who, who's going to say in every specific situation, um, you know, who's going to draw up a list of rules. There's just no way you could do that. It's, it's more like we have to, you know, Paul talks about us 
walking in the spirit. We have to be, we have to be people who are constantly living in the word of God, constantly living before the Lord and walking in the power of the spirit and constantly in prayer, seeking his help and his guidance and for him to direct the path that we're taking. And somewhere in there, all, all of the means that God has given us, we, we just, our expectation and hope is that God is going to give us grace to, at least in a general way, that we're going to move in the direction of pleasing him. Yeah, thank you. I was uh, going to say, like, for example, um, it's ne- it, it, you wouldn't say that it's like um, ever right to be completely um, just, uh, uh, you know, just uh, in self-denial when, when it comes to, uh, especially when you have a wife and uh, children, like you cannot completely be in self-denial and, and deny them also um, all things just because it's right for you. For example, always putting others first. Like, let's say if I was single, I always put others first. Uh, not that I have done, but let's say that, that, that I have done. Um, and then now that I'm married and have children, I cannot do that uh, all the time because I need to actually put my wife and children sometimes before others. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's true. I mean, you do have a responsibility. There, there is kind of a descending tier of responsibility as much as possible we're supposed to do good to all men but especially to those of the household of faith and then if you know a man that doesn't provide for his his own household is worse than an infidel and and so yeah i mean obviously god has given us our wife and our children we have a very particular responsibility and we have to weigh all those things out this, there's there's no easy formula, but <clears throat> but we do have Christ. That, you know, the big thing is we just need to pay, pay very careful attention to how Christ loved the church, and with as we behold the glory of the Lord, we know that the Spirit's in the business of conforming us to that image, from one degree of glory to another. And I think really beholding very carefully how Christ loved Paul how Christ loved Peter and the other, the other 10, uh, how he loved his early church. It's, it's the greatest example of love that we have, but it doesn't always fit our mold exactly. He doesn't always love exactly the way that we, we might think or, or anticipate. 